One way to develop an Android app quickly and in a quality manner is by reusing components that already exist instead of building them from scratch. So don't think about building a login screen by yourself because you might think, well, it's simple. I just need a username and a password. But then you have to think about things like how to handle password resets and many other things. And also single sign-on integration a lot of conveniences that we can provide to our users and we don't have to build those ourselves. So in this video we're going to take a look at Firebase Authentication which will do all of this for you and integrates really well with the other parts of the Firebase platform like Firebase Database, Firebase Cloud Firestore, Firebase Cloud Storage, so on and so forth and it integrates with several other ID providers that users already have. So you can log in with Facebook, you can log in with Twitter, log in with Microsoft, log in with Yahoo, log in with Google, and several other providers which takes a lot of work off of our plates as mobile application developers so that we can focus on our core competency instead. Let's start by navigating to the Firebase console and then choose authentication. Now get started. Note that there are several different sign-in providers that we can choose. One of the easiest to do is email. We can cover these others later, but let's go ahead and start off with email. For the moment, we'll simply enable email password validation and choose save. One really nice thing about Firebase Auth is it handles a lot of the things that we don't think about when we want to build a simple login screen. Things like email address validation, password reset, so on and so forth. And you see that there are several templates it's given us of emails that it will generate under those circumstances. Now, if we want to add another provider, we can go back to the sign in method and choose the add new provider option. And you see there are several options we can try for single sign on, which I mentioned we can try those in a later video. In this video, let's focus on getting authentication set up. Now let's implement this in our project. First, I want to navigate to the build.gradle that's at the app level. And there are two things that I need to add to the dependencies section, which is where I am here. The first one is in the Firebase Auth documentation. The second one is not, but it is required if you're targeting Android version 31 or greater. If not, you get a strange error message that says flag mutable or flag immutable must be set if you're calling a pending intent. I figured that one out the hard way. Go ahead and choose sync now. And now we can implement it in our main activity. So I have a composable function where I have a button. I'm going to borrow this and make a login button, but I want to emphasize this login button concept is temporary. Remember in a mobile app, for usability's sake, we want to put as few widgets or user interface elements on the screen as possible to accomplish our task. In other words, we do not want to complicate the user's view of our application. Many times you don't need to prompt the user for a logon. You don't need to put a logon button anywhere. You certainly don't want to start with a login screen because you'll find that you'll have a lot of users who fall off at that point who just want to try out your application. What I typically do is I will force logon only when I need to. And typically that's when I'm saving some user-based data. So eventually we'll refactor and get to that point. But right now we just want to set it up and make sure that it works. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this button and paste. And I'll simplify things a little bit by taking out all of the logic that's in the onclick there. And of course we'll change the text to log on, although we might need to get cute and say log on or log off, depending on if we have a user or not. But here again, we'll save that complication for later. Now, it'd be really easy to put a lot of logic inside this button, but then we would get way too much information in a simple on-click lambda. So let's delegate this to a new function we're going to make called sign in. I haven't made this yet, but of course the IDE can help me with this because it knows I haven't made it. So a simple alt enter and create function. It did create this for me, but I want to move it out of the flow of where I have the composables just so I can keep my composables together. I'll go ahead and move it towards the bottom of the screen. And now I can start to implement. So first thing we need to do is declare who our authentication providers are. You remember that screen that we just saw where we could set up email, we could set up Microsoft, GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple, all kinds of different logon providers. 
These are what we're going to call auth providers, and we need to put them in a collection. So let's declare that collection and then instantiate it with a Kotlin function array list of. And this will accept a list of items and we'll create an, a -list, an array list out of it. At this point, we only have one item we need to create, and that is the email authentication function. We invoke a builder factory on this. You note that AuthUI is something that's going to come from the Firebase Auth project that we just added as a dependency to our build Gradle. So, of course, we want to do that build Gradle first. Next, we need to make an intent. And remember that an intent is an indication that we want to do something. We want to open something in a browser. We want to toggle the camera on. We want to open an image gallery, something like that. In this case, we're saying that our intent is that we want to authenticate the user. So let's declare an intent. So at this point, we have another builder or factory method or function, if you will, where we're saying, okay, let's get an instance of our auth UI. Let's create the sign in intent builder. And now let's marry this up with the providers that we declared up above. So if we want to add a new provider like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Twitter, Apple, anything like that, what we'll need to do is number one, configure it on the Firebase console. Number two, do anything particular to that provider, which might be including an SHA-1 fingerprint. And then number three, we need to add that provider to our list of providers that we're creating here. Next, we create this sign-in intent. We need to fire this intent so that it will go and open our authentication flow, which is provided to us by Firebase, and then respond back to us. So it's basically asynchronous, and I'm going to have to do this in a couple of steps. I have to tie everything together, so it's easiest if we actually do the last step first, which is the part where we hear back from the sign-in. So private fund sign-in result, and then result, is a, is a parameter of type Firebase Auth UI authentication result. That's a long one, I know. Let's make sure that the result code is okay. So in other words, we have an affirmative response from the user. The user didn't cancel. The application we're calling didn't throw an exception. Basically, we have a valid response back from this intent that we have invoked. So if we do have that valid response, the good news is we can get access to a user object. And this user object has a lot of information that's going to be very helpful to us. You see it's stored in this Firebase auth get instance current user attribute. So let's go ahead and save that to an attribute of this class so that we can use it in other places. Do a bit of refactoring here. And let's make this into a property. And there we go. For the moment, we can initialize this to null. And take care of our imports. Now we return back to the sign in result function. So we know this is what's going to get called as a callback. In other words, after the user has authenticated, this is what's going to get called. So we store our user object, which is going to be very helpful in a little bit. But we also want to handle the case where the result is not OK, where something went wrong. Let's put an else part on this if test. And for the moment, we can just put in a log message. We can get a bit more fancy about this uh, in a bit. But for the moment, we just want to have a place where we can set a breakpoint. Import log. And notice that we're creating a message along with the error message or the error code that we have received back. So this is the function that will get called once we've heard back from the user. And this is the function that's going to kick off this process. And as I mentioned, I have to tie these two things together. But it's easier to tie the, the train together when we have the engine and the caboose, and we can fill in the middle. So sign in is the engine. Sign in result is the caboose. Let's go ahead and merge them together. I'm going to declare a variable. We're going to assign the return of a function call to this variable. The function that we're going to call is register for activity result. That's going to take two parameters, actually. One is going to be within the function call parentheses, and the other is going to be a lambda that follows the function call. So this syntax might look a little bit tricky if you're not used to Kotlin syntax, but remember a couple things about Kotlin. Number one, 
it's a high order functional programming language, which means we can pass functions to functions. Number two, if we are passing a function to a function, and that function is the last item in the parameter list that we are passing, then we do not need to put that function within the open and closed paren. We can put the function after the open and closed paren. So what you see here is actually a lambda that's getting passed as the second argument to this function, register activity for result. I just bring that up because as a Java developer myself, I look at this and I say, what in the world is going on? But when you simplify it and realize we're simply calling a function, we're passing an object, and we are passing a lambda or a function to that function, then it makes a little bit more sense. And by the way, what is it actually doing? Well, note that this lambda is accepting a variable called res, and it's passing it into a function called sign in result. What's sign in result? Well, that's this function down here. So effectively, we're getting the response back from the callback. We're calling sign in result, and then within sign in result, we can do our logic to handle this user. Now, finally, one more thing that we need to do. Uh, back up here in this sign in function that we created earlier, let's refer to this variable called sign in launcher, the one that we just created, and let's invoke launch on it, and let's, let's pass to that our intent. Remember, the intent is what we created right here. So intent tells the Android operating system we want to do something. Uh, An implicit intent means we don't care how it's done, just do it. An explicit intent, on the other hand, says use this class specifically to do the work. So we create the intent to say we want to log in. We pass it to the sign in launcher variable, and that does the magic of essentially kicking off the login process. And then when we hear back, we're going to hear back in sign in result. Let's take a look. The application is loaded, and I've set a couple of breakpoints. So let me go ahead and choose log on. And we notice that it's going to hit our button click from there to our sign in method. Now take a look at the screen. You notice how it left our application and now it has gone to this sign in prompt. So now I'm going to go ahead and enter an email address. And now it's going to ask me to enter a few details. And now I choose save. Now notice we get an hourglass and it comes back to our application. And notice what it's coming back to. We have our return from the sign in launcher, and now it goes to sign in result. Let's watch this very carefully and see where it goes. Is our result code OK? Well, let's see, minus one, and OK is minus one, so that looks pretty good. OK, now it's going to initialize our user. Let's step over this, and at this point, we should be able to go into our variables tab and see our user. And there's not a whole lot here that makes sense, but the good news is this object does indeed represent our user. I'm going to go ahead and say continue. Now let's go back to the Firebase console and let's make sure we're selecting our correct application and authentication. And we can take a look at users. Look at users and you notice here I am, I've logged in, there's my created date, my signed in date, and some kind of unique user ID. A big advantage of Firebase is that this user ID can be used to identify me with this email address. And it's going to be unique across all of the different ways that we can authenticate. So Firebase authentication essentially gives us a consolidated unique ID to identify our users no matter what sign in they have chosen. One other big advantage of Firebase authentication is that it persists our user across sessions. If we were to close this app and then reopen it, we wouldn't have to log on again. There is one small code change we need to do to make this happen, and it's really quite straightforward. Do you remember where we declared our user up above? Well, we simply put that same logic we saw down below in our callback function and we can assign it up here. Now it might be safer to do it down here in onCreate where things have been initialized. So I might change this to a late init var. Uh, I also could do a bit of null logic around this to make sure that uh, it's not going to return null. But essentially, that's how we can log in a user one time and then still know who that user is every time they open and close the app. 
Think about something like Facebook. Imagine if you had to log in every time you open Facebook. Uh, that would get kind of annoying. Now you just open Facebook and you're automatically logged in, as is the case with most apps. And the reality is that most phones have some kind of protection on them, whether we use a PIN or a fingerprint or a password, a traditional password, or Retina ID. So our phones already have authentication built into them. So many times we feel safe with applications that don't require login every time. The natural exception here would be something like a financial application, a banking application. You probably would want to verify every time, but if it's something that doesn't have such secure information, you're likely in good shape. Just for fun, I stopped the application, I relaunched it, and I put a breakpoint right on the first line of on create. So at this point, the variables above have been initialized. And I want to verify that if I do stop the app and I restart it, we do indeed have a valid user variable. And sure enough, you see the user as we've declared it up here, and we see it down here. We do indeed have a valid user variable. Now we can find things out about this user. And now we could really get kind of cute with this button, in the login button, and either remove it entirely or change it to a log off button. But there again, where's the log off button in Facebook? Think about your favorite apps. Where's the log off button? It's generally not prominent. It's generally something that's hidden away. And so we don't want to clutter our screen with things that are not necessary. So don't have a screaming login button if you don't need one. It's perfectly acceptable to hide it behind a hamburger menu or something like that. Something that's not going to take up a lot of screen real estate. So this has been a look at how to implement Firebase authentication in a Jetpack Compose Kotlin Android app. As always, I hope this video was helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.